You were listening to episode 284 of Game Deflators Podcast. My name's John, and I'm joined by Ryan. Hey, everybody here at the Game Deflators Podcast. We like to talk about games. We've recently picked up games we're currently playing, and we find out what happens when an unstoppable force meets an unaimable weapon in this week's Inflation Deflation Challenge. So this week we are playing some Jet Force Gemini on the N64. Ryan, what did you play it on again, by the way? Because I know you don't have an N64. I played it on NSO. Uh, NS- the Switch Online? Yeah, yeah. On the, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm curious. So we'll, we'll talk about some of that in our Inflation Deflation Challenge. I think the uh, the differences between the two, but then like the rare replay as well, because there's a version on there. So we can talk about the differences there. Yeah, uh, but that one out too. <laughs> why don't you summarize for the folks what we're uh, going to be talking about today? Yeah, so this week we will be looking at uh, Larry and declares the death of marketing as we know it, and then we'll switch over to talking about some Switch Two rumors uh, before the inevitable looms. Yeah, Ryan's favorite topic is rumors for video game consoles. It was PS5 for so long, then it was Switch Two, then it went to no Switch, back Dude, to Switch Two. When we started this podcast back at your first house, like. We talked about the Switch for like two years before it came out or something. It just yep. felt like forever. Well, uh, if you're listening to us right now, you can listen back on those episodes by following our podcast on the podcast application you're listening to right now. You can also find those old episodes on YouTube by searching Game Deflators. And you can find us on social media at The Game Deflators on Instagram, Facebook, and Threads, along with at Game Deflators on X. I did it right. It, it actually all worked out. It worked together, Ryan. There you go. It's fantastic. You go. All right, let's kick us off. Oh, oh, I, I didn't do it right because I forgot to mention our out of date website, thegamewithlaters.com. <sighs> now it's done. Okay. So almost. Re- next time. Almost. We'll get it there. We'll get, and next week it'll be changed up. Don't worry, people. So this week's pickups for me Magic Cards. My wife asked that? me, my wife asked me today, she's like, you have like 20,000 cards right there. Why do you need more? I'm like, well, these are from the new set. Like, oh, you got well, Thunder Junction stuff? Yeah, I got some Thunder Junction stuff in the mail. And uh, she's like, well, why can't you play with those cards? I'm like, because that's legacy stuff. Because well, none of that play- is legal in the format that I want to play. She's like, well, why don't you play legacy? Well, because I'm playing standard right now. Because that, that's <laughs> nobody plays legacy out here. Well, then why don't you get rid of them? I'm like, no, because standard cards that come out sometimes are old legacy reprints. So that way I don't need to buy more cards if I already have them. Like that's, your that's kind of the whole purpose. Your reprint library. Yeah, exactly. So like there's guys who are like, oh yeah, this like card is coming out of Thunder Junction is printed in whatever set. I'm like, oh cool. I got a play set already. I'm good. I don't have to spend the extra like four or five bucks to grab that one card or two cards where it may be. So I did get that. And then I talked about my Lego Mimic thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it had all come in at that point. I got lucky actually. So the guy that made like the mock Mimic Apparently, after he posted it, like it didn't get traction at first because people were still kind of looking for the, the actual mimic. Now it's gotten traction. So if you were to go on Bricklinks, apparently to try and find all the parts, you can't find all the parts. Oh, it's already been done. So I got lucky. That's that's what I was reading on Reddit. Like some people were like, oh, yeah, I can't find all the parts, blah, blah. blah. And this was obviously I did this about a week after the set had come out. So it wasn't people were still kind of like, oh, I can still pick it up my store. Oh, I can grab it on eBay. I can do this. So the traction just didn't get there for like a mock build yet. So, so lucky. Um, I don't know what, like any other way to get some of his parts if you had to go directly through Lego or, or, or what, but I'm happy I got them. I built the Mimic and it looks awesome. Yeah, it does look really good. Yeah, it's not the same eyes, but I mean, you saw the difference. I sent you a picture of Yeah, the they're eyes. fine. Yeah, I think it's perfectly fine. And if I ever really wanted to go with like that style of eyes, I could just print out sticker paper. Mm-hmm. with the with that design like it's not a big deal yeah um so that was a big thing right there for pickups and then playing my wife and i are playing our secret game uh we are about a, a little over halfway through the secret game right now so would you like to input your guesses yeah or guess? yeah so let's see here 
This is where background music would be fantastic. Okay. My question this week. Okay. Is it a co-op shooter? No. Okay. What is your guess? My guess is hmm. what was I feel what like was my question last week i don't even remember no no you're supposed to write down yeah i know um so let's see i think that my guess this week is going to be um persona 4 no wait did i sure is that the guess i guessed last week and you know what i will take that guess again you failed uh so you need to put persona actually it is is it pretty sure it is because i I didn't write it down here last i'm pretty sure it's persona 4 um well put down your guess sir mark it down uh i don't remember what your question was last week but it's not a co-op shooter and it is not persona 4 on to the other game i'm currently playing I am still playing Tales of Symphonia. Last I left off of you, we were at the Temple of Lightning. I got through said Temple of Lightning, no longer falling asleep, which is great. Uh, Finished up with the Tefeala base, got that completed. Uh, Went through to the Temple of Earth, finished that up. Went to the Temple of Ice, finished that up. Went to the Remote Human Ranch, which was kind of crazy with all those puzzles of like having to hit like the lights in order and then the figure eight shape and all of that. So finished that. And dude, that whole scene caught me off guard. Like Bota and uh, is it Shuen? I think is his name. I don't remember the two names, but the Renegades that were there. I did not anticipate joining forces with the Renegades. Like did not have that on my bingo card for Tales Mm -hmm. of Symphonia. Considering I had just beat them in a battle. So I'm like, so random for them to jump in. Uh, But we got past the Renegades uh, situation or in the remote human ranch. And then uh, within there, we had to battle uh, Rodile and his dragons. Easiest battles. I'm now like level 45 across the board Mm -hmm. and got like some pretty damn good weapons. I'm learning a little bit more on like the different item attachments, like the Sapphire, for example, that you get from the Water Spirit, I believe it is, or the Ice Spirit. It like reduces fire damage. So going into certain battles now, it's like, oh, cool. I could take less damage on certain creatures because of this. Um, so beat Rodile, Bota, uh, ends up drowning or sacrificing himself, uh, for the whole mana cannon situation of blowing up that base, um, learned more about like the great seed of mana essentially, Mm -hmm. uh, that's supposed to help like not regenerate, but like separate the two worlds. They're not constantly fighting, um, for their mana source so that they can kind of live in harmony. So learned a little bit more about that. And then, um, the mythos character so i know mythos is like this legendary uh you know warrior in the in that in you know silverant as well as tethala and so we pick up mythos in ozette i think it is and it's like oh yeah you're named after the legendary um you know the legendary warrior and i'm like that's got to be like the real mythos who just doesn't know that he's a real mythos that's mm-hmm. what i'm thinking but don't spoil it um i'll find out more and lastly, let's see what else I had here. Uh, I went to the Fire Temple, and then I went to the uh, the Manor, Barkloff Manor, I forget its name, or Balakroff Manor, and got the, uh, the spirit there. And then the only spirit I need now is from the Temple of Darkness, as well as Asuka, which is the other one. So essentially, I would say I'm in like the last third, if not quarter of the game. And, and mm-hmm. that could be actually less like I'm at 40 hours and I know the game itself is like 45 to 50. So I'm pretty damn close. I feel to beating this yeah, game you're and probably I'm loving getting it up there. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's such a good game. The, the way it, I, I we talked about it a ton last week. I'm not going to say yeah, we, we talked about again. it. I already made a yeah. guess the same as last week. Most likely it seems <laughs> no need yeah. to repeat myself. <laughs> doubling down on your points on tales of symphonia uh so either way i'm enjoying it i really like it when it's all said and done i will likely dive into alundra afterwards so back-to-back rpgs for me it's gonna be a, a long haul but luckily my wife and i have the secret game 
and that is not Persona 4, and in whatever game we play next, which I think I'm kind of debating if I want to do this or not. I told her Fallout New Vegas, and I've said it here as well, but I'm second guessing because I kind of want to play something shorter with her. Like, Fallout's going to take a while, you know, and both of us have a habit of falling asleep middle of gameplay, you know, toddler running around, all the craziness plus work. So I am questioning if it makes more sense to pull up a shorter game and just kind of that's our game together. And if she wants to play Fallout on her own, that's great. And then I'll probably play Fallout New Vegas on my own at some point, too. Mm -hmm. So don't know. That's up in the air still. But our secret game will be done hopefully by next week. Probably. Yeah. Which will be great because then I'll be able to reveal it and you would have had no clue. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I will have no idea what it was. I'll just, yeah. you know what? Maybe I'll just guess Persona 4 again next week. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. What did you get pickup wise? Uh, so this week I did a lot for, um, you know, not really the community, but for myself in terms of game preservation. <laughs> uh, I was focusing mostly on that this week. I found a great new resource. Uh, on my Vita that I've been taking advantage of. So I just got a bunch of interesting things just to kind of check out. So um, I got Shovel Knight Treasure Trove. I've always wanted to play Shovel Knight. It's one thing that I've just kind of never gotten around to. Um, it seems really fun. I played like a couple of levels. It's great. Uh, Final Fantasy X HD. I always wanted that on Vita. Uh, booted it up just to see what it looks like. It looks really good. Um, Hell Divers one is on Vita, and I was like, you know what? If I can't play Hell Divers two, I'll try out Hell Divers one. I don't even think they're the same style of game. They are not, and <laughs> I knew that. But it is challenging, and I don't think it was really meant to be a single player game as much as it was meant to be a multiplayer game. Um, I may mess around with it a bit more, but it's probably not going to be the you know what i was hoping to get like i knew it wasn't going to be the same but i was hoping to get some catharsis and it's probably just not really going to provide that i don't think uh pick a picks classic is like an anagram puzzle game i like those uh and luminous electronic symphony because i mean if it's a handheld uh playstation game you got to have luminous on it for sure definitely yeah so uh i did go back i am Going to try to commit to finishing off Final Fantasy IX. Started playing some more of that. Trying to get back to that story a bit. Uh, just kind of tried out all those other games. And then I tried playing Metal Gear Solid 1 a bit today. Uh, one of my uh, YouTubers that I used to watch, uh, Super Bunny Hop. He's been gone for a long time. He did a couple of streams trying to help himself raise a little bit of money. And um, doing Metal Gear Solid 1. So watching that and trying to play along a little bit that's pretty much what i've been up to um you know i'm super excited for paper mario thousand year door coming out in a couple weeks that'll be fun um what else has been going on not really a whole lot yeah and even in the news it's been like a slow week news wise like last few weeks have been oh. pretty slow I finished yeah. Fallout. We could talk about it. Which one? The oh, show. oh, the, sh the show. The show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Would, would and you that'll think? go good with our discussion topic, too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what did you think? Yeah. So, I mean, it, we're. I'm just going to throw out spoiler warning because, you know, whatever. I, I finished it now and John finished it. So if you haven't had time to finish it, you can always come back later. Well, uh, you're also kind of slow at this point because it's. Yeah. Like if you're you probably already it, done. Yeah. It's been three weeks actually i think four weeks since it came out so Something yeah like that yeah yeah it's it's phenomenal obviously it's like it's got to be one of the best if not the best video game adaptation and it just uses so much of like the fallout world where it's just like boom stim pack boom right away boom you know all the stuff that you see on the shelves the cram the sugar bombs you know it's just like that world is so fully realized in such a reach out and touch it kind of way like and i think fallout has all of the perfect charm that they were able to get away with like like some of the wire work look a little goofy and you know 
it didn't even matter because fallout kind of has that kind of comical buggy you know bethesda edge to it but like the ghoul and uh goggins were so good the uh vault dweller you know she just killed it she was so good as just like having that naive vault dweller but like getting hardened by the world and just like making all those decisions like a character you know would be in fallout if you were playing them it was just it was phenomenal i like the parallels where it was like hey she's out in the wasteland searching for her dad just like in fallout 3 you're searching for your dad and in i mean i guess in fallout 4 you're a dad searching for your son so it's got that kind of pull um i heard somebody point out in a video that like you're she's only ever with like one companion at a time like in the games where you only have like you and one other person that you're ever traveling with unless you uh <clears throat> do the old fallout 3 bug where you're able to get two companions oh i never i never knew that yeah you you can you can have two slaves follow oh, okay you. it's great yeah <laughs> and then of course it screws up other things in the game because it's not supposed to be a thing mm -hmm. yeah but uh what do on, you think i mean i i have it at a nine out of ten for me i wouldn't say it's the best i think last of us is still well above it in terms of adaptation but i love every facet of that show uh, i mean you've already listed so much obviously all the little tiny things like the sugar bombs and the cram and and all of that good stuff that's tied in is a nice little touch uh throughout so i definitely like that um i'm trying to think of what was there was a point i was gonna make in regards to the world oh the vaults so i actually watched a fantastic video uh probably about a, two weeks ago that goes over the lore on every single vault i think uh, i found that video and, and put it in my watch later after you mentioned it yeah it is great dude like and so you had mentioned like the the naive nature of uh it's lucy right i think mm -hmm. is the name of the character yeah so her naive nature that's inherent to just that vault though at the end of the day because there's other vaults that have different experiments which they refer to they say oh well what was your experiment in your vault and she's like what well, experiment and they're I like oh meant, you got lucky yeah i just meant like the uh you know some of the vaults were you know yeah non experiment they were having based. a normal society they were kind of like you know untouched by the outside world well and that's because those particular vaults were um high-end members of the enclave basically that were living in those vaults right so like that's where that comes into play like that's why they mentioned in a show like a good vault because a good vault was going to go to high-end members yeah. of society whereas the other vaults were basically human experimentation and i so, love how they gave the background on like vault tech and really built them up because like i know that every big corporation and everything in the fallout universe has always been like cynically portrayed and and is kind of the bad guy but i never really put it together until the show put it together and maybe it wasn't really expressed as much in games or something but like how they architect all of this and how vault tech was kind of like really the leading cause in all of this and it was just i feel like i got so much more out of this than you know i i know i think i only made it like halfway through fallout 4 but this makes me really want more fallout and we went back and tried to play fallout 4 like everybody did especially we tried booting it up again after that patch came out but my wife just didn't really like the controls and stuff on the game and yeah i just i don't know i it seems like i'm not really gonna go back to fallout 4 i'm not really going to do fallout 76 but it does make me want more fallout so i'm hoping that this is going to be so big and the second season is going to do so well that microsoft has no choice but to you know make bethesda you know release their stranglehold on this property so that they can make some freaking you know games out of it like it's just we have to wait for all of you know the next oblivion or the next uh elder scrolls game to come out before we're ever going to see another fallout and then you know starfield was such a drop in the bucket compared to what it was supposed to be like are they even going to make a starfield too when would that ever come so the interesting thing of fallout and like that we are waiting still 
so the reason our discussion topic is coming into play here is because I watched a video on Fallout Miami, which is also kind of tied into the same people who made Fallout London. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially just mods to create this whole different universe tied into the world of Fallout. So you have your vaults and everything. It's like a whole aspect. new game map, like a whole new game made by the fans instead of Bethesda. Yeah. And so like that to me is super cool. So you have all these areas that anybody can kind of not anybody can make it because it does take like a lot of skill to do this. But it's cool in the fact that there are other like there's mods out there to kind of give you more Fallout you know, than what you're well, initially anticipating. And let's uh, let's pour one out real quick for the Fallout London team and everything that happened. So when the new uh, next gen update dropped, it basically borked all of the mods that were out there if you update. So like they had to delay their release or something, or they may have still been like planning to do some release, but you wouldn't be able to like do this new update or something it's just such a crappy situation because it happened like two days after like i think they were supposed to come out on the 23rd and then the update came out on the 25th and it's just like oh man that's so so brutal and they didn't even tell them about it like this has been a huge project for years but that was definitely aware of it it's just like sorry yeah yeah i uh i didn't know all the details on that but that does not surprise me yeah <laughs> for whatever reason uh, but our discussion topic I've noted here is where would you want to have a Fallout game set? So I honestly Miami's like to be your dream, right? No, not really. No, uh, you don't want to see your home Florida fall out of no, fine? No, because, you know, you've got um, the new GTA is going to cover like a massive like up to like Orlando or Okeechobee all the way down to the Keys like that. Well, yeah, but not in a post-apocalyptic environment. No, but I still get to see all those landmarks and stuff versus a post-apocalyptic environment. You're kind of like, is that what I think it is? Oh, it is. It's just not the same. Yeah. Um, I think for, uh, for me, it's more of the experience, you know, gameplay wise. Um, so I would say. God, man, like I'm torn between seeing something like Alaska and then having like a tie in of, you know, Russia tied in with fallout right so you have like russians are taking over and like different things tied in because of that close proximity or like texas because texas you could do like the whole everything's wild west well you know there. about like did you ever play operation anchorage no that was a fallout 3 expansion where you go to alaska what? because alaska is where china invaded what? in like the war yeah that's all i did not know that ah mm -hmm. oh, okay so i need to go ahead and play that yeah I mean, that's kind of when you asked the question the other day, that's kind of where my mind went to. Like, I think it would be cool to have like a stretch that goes from like maybe Portland and then like through Canada up to Alaska and kind of have like because in I think it's the opening cutscene of Fallout 1. It shows like the U.S. annexation of Canada. So Canada is part of the U.S. in that future where the U.S. doesn't exist anymore anyways. But yeah. I think it would be interesting and you'd have like a lot of diverse kind of terrain and area. Um, the other thing that I've always wanted to see as a Fallout game, and I don't know if it's too like antithetical to like the Fallout universe, because you're always like a vault dweller. I mean, I guess there's the one where you're Brotherhood of Steel, but I always thought it would cool be cool to just be like like a game where you're raiders, like where you're like, one of the like people just on the surface like doing the bad stuff trying to make a living like really scrapping it out like that's a lot of what you get in you know all of the extra gameplay features like the crafting and everything in fallout so i mean it it's the same world but just kind of from the other perspective of the hero yeah i was gonna say because like technically you can become bad in yeah games. you could like... become bad but it would be cool just to be like you know yeah, a raider from, from the that and have a story where you're like of that culture. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy because it's only like four generations worth, right? Maybe five generations of people, technically speaking, when you go back to like the big war and when everything happened. Um, so, yeah, I, dude, Fallout lore in general is badass. But yeah, I kind of go back videos on Fallout lore, too. Yeah. And like the the show itself is basically cliff notes. Yeah, Fallout. 
is what it kind of comes out to. But to kind of go back to that discussion topic, though, I think seeing as Alaska is taken and my secondary would be Texas, Texas would be a pretty cool one. If you could do like the, I mean, the state's massive, Mm -hmm. right? So like you could technically do the entire state and you'd be golden. And it would take you four days to walk across it. Mm, Pro, well, technically in Fallout, yes. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So um, I would say probably a really cool setting would be to get, you know, a totally different studio to do like that timeline but in china see what like fallout in china would be like from the other side of the war totally and like what all their propaganda would be like as opposed to like the propaganda and the stylings that were used because like i bet you know china in the 50s but the 50s pulled you know 80 years in the future or 280 years in the future would be crazy well and then I guess another random thing would be, what about all this, the places that are kind of remote, right? Like, how how's Hawaii affected in this? Like, is Hawaii blown up as part of Fallout, I would imagine? But what about, like, you know, it was like random islands out in the Indian Ocean where they have, like, tribes and such that have lived there for centuries undisturbed, things of that nature? Like, how are they affected in a Fallout game? Not to say, like, I that's the setting I would want to play in, but I'm kind of curious, like, in all of these different scenarios of where you could be in fallout, like how are those small remote areas affected? I'd be really curious. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, but they've, I don't know. I, I know some fallout lore, but I don't know like a lot of a deep, deep lore. So I would be kind of curious to learn more about that if it exists. Yeah. All right. Well, let's dive into some of these articles. You are triggering me on this first one, by the way. So Larry and publishing director. (laughs) Yeah, I know damn well why you did this. Uh, It says marketing is dead because players don't want to be bamboozled. And we learned that with Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, This is Jordan Gerblick at Games Radar. This was the dumbest article that you could have provided me, Ryan. Why is that? So this is uh, this is a quote from uh, Larry and publishing director Michael Douse. And uh, he said, yeah, marketing is dead. It truly is. I can back this shit up, man. There's no channels anymore. It doesn't work. You used to have marketing, communication, and PR. Marketing was essentially a retail theory. You were trying to get your box in the right point of the shelf, or the store shelf, and you have partnerships with retail stores. Those pipelines are gone. Now you've got the internet. Nobody is looking at ads anymore. All of the channels that we would usually market through are no longer viable. So their function is also reduced by the fact that players just want to be spoken to. They don't want to be bamboozled. They just want to know what you're making and why you're making it and who it's for. So this has been spoken by somebody that has no flipping clue what marketing is. Well, so because I mean, the he, game, there's he no mentions shelf space anymore. Nobody's even going to sell the next generation of video games in a store. So like you still got to market it. Yeah, but it's, the thing it's is to be marketed. Like, the the thing is i think that he's mostly talking about kind of like the giant marketing push and how everything was done before like you're still gonna need marketing but like in a world where everybody has ad blocker and the only video game ads i see are paid embedded sponsorships you know from like the youtubers that i watch like and those are majorly mobile games that I'm never going to download anyways. Like I don't see ads for big budget games in my day-to-day life. And I am fully obsessed with video games and in the know of like what's coming out. And I see that all from other people that are talking about it and talking about the great games they're expecting. But like if a bad game comes out, I only hear about it bad enough that people make content about it. So a few things to note here. If you watch any of the game shows that are out there, like, you know, game, game awards, that type of stuff. Oh yeah. Big every single trailer, everything is that's marketing. Yeah. If that's you, marketing, but that's like a one event thing. It's not like you see, putting out ad rolls and making in-store displays and stuff. You don't have to make in-store displays nowadays. Like, Exactly. Most shopping is done online anyway. So if you're looking at, I don't know, say you're looking at PlayStation 5 games and you see a suggested game, marketing, 
there are dollars tied to things of that nature, those games. If you yeah. want Steam and you see a game that you might be interested in, games that are sitting on the front of Steam, that's marketing. Like just because the one pipeline of retail has died does not mean that marketing itself is dead. There are so many things like Adblock. There's only so far Adblock can go. Like you're still going to get marketed to. You're still going to have the embedded videos to your point. Yeah, on but YouTube how that you're many people are being compelled by that thing that they try to avoid so desperately? That's the thing. Like you can't avoid marketing. Like, and what's funny is this article that you sent me, there was like ads like crazy in the overall like thread of text. Like it was just a little blurb of text marketing, a little blurb of text marketing, a little blurb of text marketing. Like it was covering yeah, this but entire none website. Of, none of the ads on this page are for like for you specifically any new video games because it's retargeting based off of other things that you've seen. So on mine, for example, right now it's showing soundboards and TCG player because it's going based off of Google display ads based on cookies on my computer. So if you were actively looking for video games on a consistent basis, then you're going to see video game advertisements in your Google display ads. You're not well, seeing because you you're not. I look for video games more than the average person. I don't look for video games that often. And when I do, it's on like Amazon or I'm reading a article here or on Twitter. Yeah, so but I don't, like our, not... our Google feeds are full of a lot more stuff that should be feeding us. Hey, here's Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Like, yeah, but that have you also seen ads highly... for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth unless you looked them up yourself? I did when it first came out because I was actively looking for Final Fantasy VII. But the thing you have to consider is that the publisher or developer, whoever it is, has to also be paying for that marketing to happen. So if you're not yeah. seeing it, it, there's a couple things tied to it. It's either because you're searching for things that are not related to said product, so you're okay. not going to see it, or they are not actively paying for display ads to be able to market to you. So it's not to say that marketing is dead and I'm not seeing marketing. It's that the marketing is being targeted towards things that you are more likely to purchase, which is why it's showing in a certain manner. Um, yeah, but yeah. I mean, like marketing is supposed to get the greatest amount of people. You and I are still the most exposed to this. Like if they can't even effectively market to us because the AdSense is picking up that we would rather look at other things, it's definitely not showing it to the lay person. Well, I mean, it just depends on, on what's happening. I mean, if somebody's actively looking up Switch content, they're actively on YouTube and they're watching Switch videos and Mario stuff, then I do yeah, that. I do that yeah. every day. <laughs> But that's also dependent on Nintendo putting out advertising and paying for that advertisement. If they're so not, then you're not going to the see it. that's the thing there. Like, publishers spend, like, almost equal to the cost of a game sometimes on marketing a game. Traditionally, yeah, not, that's what you hear. It depends on the marketing. If they're doing, like, I see social media marketing all the time when I'm on Facebook, dude. I see videos for games all the time on Facebook. I'll see them occasionally on Twitter like but it's other people posting stuff um so more than likely it's it depends on their ad spend and what they're doing man like but that most publisher, game publishers spend a ton of money in yeah, general it, on marketing like that's yes. the historic way of it so like the thing it just I'm, depends on where it's at that's yeah. it depends on like you it have to go consider, into any kind of bucket for marketing exactly it, it depends on their campaign strategy what they're actively trying to do for marketing they could say we have a hundred thousand dollars and 90 percent of that is going to go towards the development creation and distribution of um our overall video package for this video game and here's the channels that we're going to put it into and the channel may not involve even youtube maybe it's like it's just facebook and maybe it's threads and instagram and like that's where the the bulk of not saying that's the right way to go, but that could be where it's distributed. And maybe they're not distributing it in other channels that are going to go based off the channels that they think their target audience is in. And that's where they're going to market. So the other thing to consider is that you have a younger generation of gamers. So the areas that you and I are constantly on the types of ads that were provided are more than likely targeted based off our age or location, all these other things. Whereas you might have younger kids browsing on the internet and they're getting more of that advertising than we are from a spend perspective. Could so be. I wouldn't say that it's marketing is dead. I think that's absolutely the wrong way to take that. And I think that that was somebody that doesn't know what they're talking about. With marketing. So I, seeing I get as the how channel the publishing director for the game of the year last year, which sold mm -hmm. incredibly well. And he was in charge of the marketing for that and said that he learned the lesson of, how they marketed it 
and probably the fact that they didn't have to do as much as they thought that tr they traditionally would have to be successful i'm wondering if that's going to trigger other publishers who see this to be like oh great we don't have to spend as much on ads and marketing anymore so we could just pocket all that extra money now and make our bottom lines go up even more and in that See? kind of future you're probably going to wind up with like a bunch more games either falling through the cracks because there you, you don't hear about them or you're going to wind up with just like i i don't know some other new type of like so here's where because you mentioned he's a yet. <laughs> so you mentioned he's a director he's involved in marketing blah 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 right you know where he's gone wrong here? He said, because of what we learned at Baldur's Gate 3. Baldur's Gate 3 was a critical success, heavily driven by word of mouth, heavily driven by good reviews and pre-release, which then catapulted it to high-end success because of that. It wasn't because we didn't put a ton of dollars in marketing or we put too much money. Whatever. It's because they got enough traction that it organically was able to get that word of mouth out there. That's well, how they, they were able to sell as many units because everybody was talking about it. It yeah. wasn't a matter of like, oh, we blitzed everywhere and, and we wasted dollars. Like, no, dude, like you got lucky is what it came no, out. No, they didn't get lucky. They made a really good game. They that did. stood on its own. That's what they're saying when they say they don't want people to be bamboozled. Like people don't want publishers spending so much money to release an all cg trailer that has nothing to do with the gameplay and shows nothing about what the experience is actually going to be and then they do that three or four times before you ever actually see the real game and by that time it's not you know what you thought it was going to be all this time like you don't have to do that you can just release content that's actually about the game and probably that... costs a lot less to produce and put out that is correct. And we've talked about that a number of times in the past. Like, don't show me a trailer, show me actual gameplay. Like, that's a given. So basically what I'm saying is his take on this. There's a number of things wrong. Like I said, organically, it was a huge success because of that. Primarily the organic distribution of knowledge about this game. It didn't fall through the cracks. It's a great game. We'll mm -hmm. give them that. Got stellar reviews. We'll give them that. There are other games out there that are phenomenal that don't get any sort of traction. And you know why? Because they're not marketed and nobody knows about it. And so they fall through. And then as far as like the CGI trailers, all that stuff, yeah, he's right. Like we don't need all these trailers. We need good marketing that shows the nitty gritty details about the game, what it's all about. What can we expect from a gameplay perspective? What can we expect from story? Keep the CGI trailers light, but show me more of what I'm going to experience. You tie all that together with good marketing, and a good game and it's going to be successful and get the gamers. So I would love to see another title by this developer go through with no marketing and see what happens. Well, look at uh hollow Knight <laughs> silk song. That's like one of the most anticipated indie games because we haven't seen anything about it in so long. Like there's nothing new but it's that anybody can look at or guesstimate about. Like there's no marketing happening at all for it. And everybody is dying at every presentation like is this where we're going to see it is this where we're going to see it is it going to shadow drop and no marketing that you're not aware showing of. up no, it's no like, marketing that you're aware of no, that, that's it, the thing like there could be marketing you and i are not aware of it like unless they have come out and said our marketing budget is absolutely zero well, they There's haven't marketing. put out any trailers or any announcement there was like one tweet or something like a couple of weeks ago and that's something that companies do as well to generate hype. If you put out just a hint of things, get people talking that is organic content that's out in the market that people are actively talking about. They're getting hyped up when that trailer comes out. It's going to hit hard because they've put stuff out there. You don't have to technically like from the get go. They're right in the sense. You don't have to technically go all out with marketing yet because you're going to pick up people that don't know about the game. You've got your hardcore fans that are like, Hollow Knight. I played the first one. I want to play the next one. I'm super stoked. Here's a little hint of something that's out there. Rumors that are swirling. Now people are talking. You don't have to put marketing out yet. What you have to put marketing out for is the people that don't know it's going to be coming out. Don't know it exists. The people that need to know, hey, I want this game now. Like that's where the marketing comes into play. 
Hollow Knight, I mean, it's it's going to sell itself for the most part because it's already Hollow Knight 1 and now this one that's coming out. Um, but I will say when it comes to some of this organic hype and stuff that's coming out, like the Switch 2, for example, that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. They, they haven't marketed anything on Switch 2, but we're talking about it because there's rumors and there's other things that are out there. That doesn't need any crazy amount of marketing up front. But what is going to need marketing is when it well, finally front has even its shelves. It hasn't even happened yet. There is no it, front yet. We haven't even begun. Yeah. They haven't even acknowledged that it's officially a thing. Yeah, but same. Well, I mean, they've so said you that can't they're market something, something that you haven't even admitted to existing. But we know it's coming. They know it's going to be released. They are letting us continue to talk about this subject to hype it up like crazy. Well, they know the Switch 3 is going to happen, and they're not marketing that yet either. For the See, same that, reason, because it doesn't publicly exist yet. That we don't know, but we have enough rumors based on this article that we're going to cover today that's going to show that, yes, we do know enough about the Switch 2. Whether it's called a Switch 2 or not, is up. that's up for debate. We don't know what that's going to be yet. We do know there's a successor console coming out. We know that it's going to have, likely or not know, but the rumors are stating it's going to have XYZ things tied to it. And Nintendo is allowing that to happen because they don't have to do anything. They can sit on their butts all day long, wait for us to continue talking about it, put out a couple teasers, and that's going to do the work for them as well. So end of the day, man, marketing is needed. Marketing is not dead. Uh, they got super lucky, in my opinion, with a great game that they could organically market through organic marketing, by the way. It doesn't have to be paid marketing. They did it organically. And they were successful. I mean, there's nothing negative in general about this i just think that he's i mean you have somebody that's you said involved in marketing saying that marketing is dead i think that's wrong i don't think it's the right approach all right uh anything else in that before we go to switch nope rumors all right so switch accessories manufacturer seemingly posts details of the switch too and this is through uh sicker at my nintendo news uh do you have the article up or do you want me to pull it up yeah i got it Okay, so uh, this is, let's see here, Mopad, which is a Nintendo Switch accessory manufacturer, published some details regarding the Switch 2 on their Billy Billy page. So uh, they talk saying that it features a 1080p screen with a dock capable of 4K output, uh, new Joy-Con buttons, and is backwards compatible with Switch games. Uh, it says that the Bluetooth chip of Switch 2 still supports existing Joy-Con and Pro controllers and still features HD vibrations. Uh, the Switch 2 will have backwards compatibility, but Switch cartridges, Switch 2 cartridges will be different and won't fit into the Switch 1. I'm wondering if they're going to have that little like uh, side growth thing like the 3DS carts did. Uh, it says the new Joy-Cons are larger and magnetically attached to the console with an electromagnet and that the SL and SR buttons are metallic now and that there's a new button behind each Joy-Con um, and a new button below the home button on the right Joy-Con. Uh, they said the dock still has a USB-C port and will also support a 4K image output. The new kickstand has a damping bracket uh, on the back for improved angle adjustment and the screen is a little bit bigger up to eight inches and a resolution upgrade to 1080p so that is a lot of possible specs there that we should still all take with a grain of salt but it sounds pretty good what do you think john honestly man this is super super detailed as far as like differences and, and additions and things of that nature for this console, I know take over a grain of salt, but I think it's true. I mean, some of this here. stuff is, is going to be stuff. Anybody could probably guess like none of this is so specific that I would say that this is like, not something that everybody, like everybody knows that there would have been a USB C port, uh, that you could probably still use the old joy cons that it's probably backwards compatible. Yeah, but things it's like gonna have 1080p. Hey, it's, yeah, but like 4K image output on dock, like was I mean, that a given? Every TV that you buy is 4K if it's over well, $250, pretty much. The backwards compatibility note on Switch One cartridges fitting and Switch Two not being 
compatible switch one we obviously know that's a thing but the way that it's described won't fit right like that's the key thing whereas if you had like say playstation but that's how you would describe the no. 3ds you would say that yes. the games don't fit in the regular ds yeah except like game boy advance where or game boy color i mean where like it could technically fit in the game boy right like that's something that could fit didn't mean it worked but it fit uh you can have a playstation 5 game it fits in a ps4 it fits in a ps3 2 and 1 doesn't mean it's backwards compatible so i think that's you know one key thing to note is like the cartridges are obviously different that's noted the magnetic joy cons i don't think we would have anticipated that as a thing but i mean it, it sounds likely it's something yeah. they would do now i do question though like it's a magnet so what happens if it touches the screen like is that still a thing no i don't know screens yeah, aren't okay. made of that kind of stuff anymore dude that's that's how old school i am at this point like yeah I, I still worry when my kid runs a magnet and he's like running towards the tv and i'm like no slap no i mean away. it's probably still not the best thing but i don't think it's the same kind of thing that everybody thinks about and also you know they're going to design it in a way where it's not going to easily destroy itself now what i'm thinking is that the magnets on there are going to make it even more likely that they are able to implement the portrait mode design that I came up with that I am still betting will be the weird gimmick for the Switch 2. Because think about it. Why would it need to be easier to take on and off the controls unless you needed to attach them in more places easier? Mm. Mm, good point. And also, you know, it'd be kind of cool if they were magnetic that they can just clip together themselves instead of having to have that weird like middle piece. Well, yeah, no, I definitely agree with you on that. Um, you know, a couple other things to kind of notate here in why I think it's true. Uh, it's a language. So like the new kickstand, right? You could say it has a new kickstand for added ability, but it's like has a dampening bracket on the back, like little nuances like that in their copy here. Um, he says, let's just see, there's another piece here. Uh, the SL, SL and SR buttons are metallic. Like that's just so like, well, yeah, but like, I could say extra... something that specific. It doesn't make it true. I, but why would they? Like, that's the because question. Because that's like, what why everybody's would you... doing these days. But that's the thing. Like, you can have rumors, but why go into Like, they could just say, hey, there's new buttons on the back of the control. Cool. Or there may be new buttons on the back of the control, but they are going into greater detail. Hey, mm -hmm. they're metallic. That's a level of detail that somebody that has seen it is more likely to say, hey, it's a so... metallic button. Like, because then we're going to look at and Moby pad and be like, no, you guys are liars. Like, this why is did the you thing, say, though, you know, that is weird about this. So I heard another rumor yesterday. Um, and this one was from another like manufacturer, like accessory manufacturer. And they said that their engineers, uh, when they like brought them in, they weren't actually allowed to see the console. They said that <laughs> Nintendo made them reach into a box and they were allowed to hold and feel it, but that they weren't allowed to actually see it. So somewhere between that and here uh, probably exists the truth. But yeah, I mean, like, I don't know if you would be able to feel that those buttons are metallic, are metallic. or if that's something you'd have to be able to see, or even know. if it's something that you would like necessarily, like you would have to notice that it would be like, it have to be like a coloration where you feel like the coldest of the metal. I, uh, you know, the only thing that's gone through my mind now is you have a Nintendo rep holding a box at their waist. And it's like, no, I, I need you to put the box on the table. That old SNL song. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's my switch like, in no. a box. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> my switch in a box. Yeah. <laughs> oh man dude i just i can imagine like a big box and it has like the curtains and you have to reach in mm -hmm. and it's like oh is that a switch too what is that no no that's a wii u you got it wrong <laughs> it's a wii me a wii me <laughs> it's a my wii <laughs> it's a my wii it's a my wii oh this man. is the mario edition oh jeez <laughs> the mario edition <laughs> so oh, man With yeah mushroom the Cap switch all. two we're all excited for it i mean it's at this point it seems unlikely that we'll probably see it before the end of the year i mean the best guess at this time is probably that 
they will do an announcement sometime in the next few months, begin their marketing ramp because marketing isn't dead. And then, you know, probably come out spring next year and come out with like the most kick-ass launch lineup. Like we're probably going to have Metroid 4. We're probably going to have a new Mario. We're probably going to have like maybe a new Mario Kart for the first time in like more than 10 years or something. You got new tracks. It's usually how it goes, right? Um, all I, all I honestly care about is backwards compatibility. That's yeah. really all I care about. Cause if that happens, I can get rid of my switch one and put it towards the switch two and then just enjoy that. That'll be my goal. Would you, the fact that, yeah, dude, I'm honestly even considering selling my game consoles, like my older consoles and buying a poly mega. Really? Yeah. That's so shocking. Well, like. I just for Sega Saturn, Sega CD, for example, if I can get a poly mega and just download the games onto the console, but have the physical games, be able to play them like that or just download it. That to me seems more worthwhile than doesn't your Retron play like a bunch of stuff already. It does. So I would keep my Retron for cartridge based stuff and I'd probably do the poly mega for disc based games. I mean, you just That's have a PC. At. I do, but then I would have to figure out ways to like, you know, I'd have to get a CD drive and figure out a way that I can rip the files on a computer. And no, I just, I don't want to mess with that. Poly mega would just be much easier. Um, okay. cons I'm considering it. I don't know yet, but let's dive into our inflation deflation of the week. And that is jet force Gemini developed by rare published by rare directed by Lee Schumann. Did I get that right? Yeah. I don't Schuneman? know. Schuneman? Schuneman. Something like that. Schuneman. I need to read these names in advance because you always throw like some random ones in there. You could have just said Lee and Paul and that would have been fine. <laughs> Lee and uh, Paul, you know, those guys, <laughs> those guys, uh, Paul Mountain is the other name here. It was released in October of 1999. That was almost 25 years ago, dude. So you know what needs to happen here is a 25 year anniversary remake. That's what I need. Um, it is a third person shooter action adventure platform. Reception is around an eight to nine out of 10. Surprisingly, surprisingly. I wouldn't say surprisingly. I think it's the same lines as like Zelda Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time, I have been on record as saying it is the most overrated Nintendo 64 game on the face of the earth. And that for its time, it was good. For today, it is trash. And I will stick it to this game as well. For its time, fantastic. Today, garbage. But go on with the synopsis, Ryan. All right. So Juno, Vela, and their dog Lupus are galactic law enforcement team. The game follows their mission to save the tribals, this group of little bear people legally distinct from Ewoks. They're being <laughs> captured and their planet attacked by the evil alien Mizar. You must uh, unite with your team to save the day from Mizar and his bug alien army. It Was is... that in the wiki or did you actually put the Ewok comments under yourself? I put that in there. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, I mean, they look like little Ewok people. Kind no, of. you're right. They totally do. I am 100% on board with that. Except I for the they green were Ewoks. Ones. There's just a, one of them is green for some reason. So, yeah, well, that's, that's Yoda. He's leading this... them. Yeah, exactly. So this game is right off the bat. I'm going to say impressive. I'm not ragging on it, given it, saying that the score is overrated for, you know, other reasons other than the gameplay itself. But yeah, this game is crazy for an N64. It's like a pretty interesting third person shooter. It must be really different playing on the N64 controller, I would imagine, because it's always a different experience when you use that controller as opposed to like a modern control scheme. But it was, it's pretty wild. It's got really good graphics. It's got a lot of more, like, action than I was expecting. Like, for an N64 game, like, your ship gets invaded and you're just, like, blasting people with a gun and these bugs are exploding and you can pick their heads up after they died as, like, a collectible. <laughs> Danny DeVito. Let's just blast it. <laughs> yeah. So it's... um it's wildly inaccurate is the biggest issue. Like trying to fight in this game, like you just spray and pray with hip fire or you go into the worst first person shooter mode with inverted controller uh, for the Y axis. And it just like, 
it has this crazy snapback reticle which is the bane of the game's existence like you go into first person mode and you can strafe to kind of move around still or you know go forward or backward but if you can't you're, go backwards can you I think I was able to like, so I wasn't the version that I was playing on had like an expert control mode, which I think let you do some more things. Um, Cause like I, when I was in the first person mode in the expert mode, I could still strafe around and move, but yeah, I could strafe around and move too, but I couldn't go backwards. Okay. Cause I tried. Yeah. I can so, only, I can only drop on the ground or jump. Yeah. Anyways, when yeah. you're in the, the first person mode and you're trying to target, Every time you move the reticle up, if you let go of the tension on the stick, it just retracts back to the middle. So, like, yep. you can't just, like, move up to adjust your aim unless you, like, push the vision box, like, by moving to the border of your screen. And it just is so hard to line up shots. Like, you can get behind cover, try to line your gun up, and as soon as you come out from the cover, you realize you're, like, nowhere near shooting the target that you thought you were going to be once you come out around that cover it's just like and some of the enemies are so relentless like did you get to the part where all of like the drone spawn and they just yeah. like rush you with just like 20 drones with like automatic right uh like machine guns just rush you out of nowhere i don't know how i survived any of that to be honest i died several times in that area and then, of course, there's continues for the level, which mm -hmm. I think is needed. Um, the benefit, though, is you have like your Gemini health bar, right? And it's, I would say, and I, I agree with everything you've said so far. And that's where I think it's garbage, by the way. I think uh, if you look at the rare replay that was released, they actually put out a patch on the game that's supposed to correct shooting, if I recall, or like the aim. That's the worst part. I'd and be the, interested Ryan, to check that version out. I think I have it. So if I can get the... Uh, the patch it's on, on game there. pass on... too oh okay well i don't know if it's on game pass but check it out the patch and let me know um the difference there but you're completely right on like the aiming piece what i ended up having to do um was exactly what you're talking about but luckily everything was like one shot for the most part so when you get the machine gun in the game all of those drones that are up high you just strafe and you just go like crazy and hope yeah. that you hit them uh, which is great but then there's some on the bottom that you can actively hit so in the hip shooting, I think it's great. I don't think there's any issue there. Like that to me is fine. The camera angles aren't as bad as like Zelda or Mario. I think the camera angles are actually okay in this game. And the strafing definitely helps the going down and rolling side to side. Like all of those cool things that are in this game, I, I think are fantastic. I like the story. I like the, uh, the voice that kind of covers like what's happening and the level and what you have to do there. Uh, I like the overview on the levels that you're jumping into. The character designs, while it's an N64 game and they've aged, they're decent. They're not bad. Yeah. I really think a, a game like this, I would love to see remade of like the most recent Unreal Engine. I think you would get a fantastic game if you were to do that. Like, and just straight up remake. Uh, fix the aiming with like modern day dual sticks for shooting and everything. Uh, and just kind of overhaul that. And I think it's a stellar game still. The eight to nine out of 10 is obviously first time today's day and age with that aiming and the difficulty tied to it. I mean, it's the argument could be made like, well, if you grew up back then playing it, you would have been playing it. Everybody rated an eight out of nine. But the fact that we have better controls today and then you kind of compare to that, you could say, no, it, it's back then, sure, eight out of nine today, I would say a five. If just on the gameplay alone, because it almost makes it unplayable in some aspects. Yeah, it's super challenging. And I mean, admittedly, in the reviews and stuff, people say that it was really challenging back in the day. Like nobody really shied away from that being a fact. But I think it was just kind of so ahead of its time in some ways that it just made it stand out so much. Like I think we had a pretty similar experience to this as we did when we tried to play Perfect Dark a while ago. Like that was on our like, we did three games that were nine out of tens or something shooters. And that we was actually on that released. List. Oh, we, we haven't even released that episode. No. Oh, so, well, spoiler we did for it. a future episode. Yeah. But it it's just like years. the same thing you were saying with Zelda, like some of these older games, they were so far ahead of everything around them that I wish that they had better chances to evolve. Like Zelda got immediately better 
after that one. Like that one set up the new framework and then everything from there like just started running. And I think in the ways that like Rare didn't really get that opportunity. Like they didn't get to make a Jet Force Gemini 2 for the GameCube that took everything and just evolved it to that next step. And they didn't really get to do that with Perfect Dark until Perfect Dark Zero for the 360, which was not like a very successful game. I think in retrospect, it was like a launch title, but I don't think it's really remembered that well. And then there's also, um, you know, just the fact that the game has some other things that hold it back. We would never have gotten to this playing it, uh, but I did watch some reviews on the game after I played it this morning for a bit. And they say that at the end of the game, it really bogs down. Like you have to rescue all of the tribals to be able to finish the story. But when you go into an area, you have to rescue them all in one go. Like if you finish that level segment and go out like the red door, um, if you didn't collect them all, it doesn't count. And if you go back, you have to collect all of them in one go. It doesn't remember the ones that you collected. And so later on in the game, once you eventually get uh, Vela and the dog, uh, you have to go back to these areas. Like you have to go to every area with basically every person to do everything in the game to be able to finish the game, not just to get like extra stuff. That's harsh, dude. Yeah. And then there's weird things like you collect those ant heads to unlock bonuses and you need 100, 200, and 300 heads to be able to unlock but they don't stack and they don't count between characters yeah see i mean it's little things like that that you question like why this was an eight to nine out of ten when it was released right because well, like like you mentioned nothing the bog... else had been like that like there was no other game that probably even had like all that going on with those graphics at that time like it was probably just so like holy cow, look how much they did. Like, how can we not give this? It's got a bunch of mini games in it too. Like there's a racing a game that yeah. has a bonus level that you get. It's like the ultimate, like once you get 300 of those heads, I think, or I think you need to beat the, I think you said you need to beat like the fastest lap time on both of the tracks. And then you unlock a Diddy Kong racing level for the racing mode. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I can see what you're saying. Like back then it's, oh wow we've never done this before this is something we've never seen this is unbelievable hey it, the controls are hard yeah there's some quirky things at the end but there's no way we can't give them an eight to, it's kind of like when you have a movie like where the movie hits all of these like cinematic barriers that nobody thought possible avatar i guess would be an example of that like all of these different things like let's just kind of cast aside that the movie itself is not that great, but it's got all these cool things going for it. So yeah, it's a masterpiece all of a sudden. I get that. Like that, that tracks as far as like why this could potentially be an eight to nine out of 10 back then. And then we're today we look at it and we're like, yeah, it's really cool for back then, but is it really at the end of the day, a great game? Yeah. It's an okay game. Yeah. I would still love to see this in modern day, controls and graphics i would totally play it but as it stands right now it's an okay game i almost would prefer to just have the game with modern day controls and the same graphics that would probably like, i don't know how okay well these too. characters like with their like blue pigtail things like i don't know how well that's gonna translate to um unreal 5 hey you never know until and it these, happens like, right big generic ant enemies i every time i saw the ants i'm like it's bug's life that's right what we're doing right now <laughs> that's we're, what I we're killing too. yeah we went miniature split. And we're... <laughs> there's split kill him um all right so brass tax complete in box will run you 54.99 it peaked at 70 32 in february of 2022 it is trending up in price a loose copy right now will run you 11.99 it peaked at 14.99 in october of 2022 that's trending down uh, digital console you can get on nintendo switch online you can get it on game pass with rare replay or a pick pick up a copy of rare replay i think it's on the 360 or xbox one um and then 29.99 if you wanted to just purchase it digitally as well as a rare replay so yeah. grand scheme of all of us 
12 bucks for an okay game i still think is not bad it's not considering it's n64 one thing i will say about this game though that i've always thought um dope box love the box on this game this is i've got a complete box copy yeah for 54 bucks complete in box n64 game i mean that's like probably less than what it costs new when it came out in the 90s well, and it's a <laughs> oh in terms of publisher it's a rare game right so how often do you see a game from rare you know complete in box selling for sub 60 bucks yeah so like i would say there's today. really not a bad way to go on this one like i definitely think it's worth getting it's definitely worth playing it's probably not a game you're ever going to finish but like if you're a collector and you don't have this, I don't see it not being worth putting in your collection, either just at that nice loose price or if you can get a good deal on like the box. I mean, the box itself is only 17 bucks. So you get a box and a loose game and the manual like usually independently for cheaper than the complete in box price. But if it's only 17 bucks, it's probably not that uncommon. You probably go to like a convention and find this game and be happy with what you got while you were there. It's probably not a game that you have to like specifically specialty order on eBay in a bidding war because it's impossible to find. Yeah. I mean, it's not a, I mean, I would say it's not a common game, but it's, I wouldn't say it's like a hidden gem or anything either. You know, I, I think it's an okay game that was released by rare. So it's a well-known publisher. It was good for its time. I'm actually kind of shocked. It's as cheap as it is, uh, given N64 collecting as a whole. Uh, I would say I that assumed it looking... was going to be way more. I just always assume yeah. N64 games are going to be way more these days. I thought it was gonna be like 25, 30 bucks. So I was shocked when I saw the price point here. Um, I think if you're looking for something to play and you can get over the poor controls or like maybe you, love n64 games so much that you can disregard the fact that the controls are just absolute ass then yeah jump on this at 12 bucks um i will say for my own personal rating here i'll say it's deflated like you know even if the game is okay and i'm not a huge fan of it i can see this still selling for 15 bucks and people being happy picking it up for 15 dollars. man i can't even believe even 20 bucks that is worth more on price charting than this game it's crazy. Yeah, I, I'm think like Tony Hawk is actually like Tony Hawk Pro Two. Elmo's Letter form. Adventure is twelve ninety nine. There you go. So I mean, if you can deal with Elmo's Letter Adventure, you know, save a dollar and play Jet Force Gemini. Well, All right. Well, yeah, good stuff. Do, uh, I don't know what we're playing next week. Have you figured it out? You no, have it'll be. I'll be over there, so we'll have whatever we want. All right. Maybe uh, if we can, I haven't tried the Turbo Graphics Mini on my new PC setup here mm. with the HDMI and stuff. So let's, I don't know. We haven't done anything that. on that in a while. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's see if that connects on, because I'm using monitors now, whereas in the past I used a TV. So I don't know how that's going to translate. I don't even know if I have it connected. So yeah, we'll, we'll see that. We'll see if it works. So expect that but also expect that things may change when you listen to the next episode. All of that said, this has been episode 284 of the Game Deflators podcast. My name's John. I'm Ryan. And thanks for listening.